The best-selling book in history remains one of the most controversial. It's revered by Christians as God's holy word. The Bible spans centuries of history, contains a variety of literary styles, and culminates all together into the person, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But how do we know that it's true? I mean, isn't this just a collection of story and myth? And even if it does contain some history, it, how do we know that we can trust it completely? The Bible was written such a long time ago. How can we believe it's true? But I would say the Bible does have a large impact on the world today. But still, that question of trustworthiness comes back. Well, I don't know how much you know, but the Bible is not one complete book that just was written at one point in history. Instead, the Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years, and it was written by several authors. And although it, we view it as one book, it's actually a collection of many books, and we call it God's Word, even though God did not physically write it. Instead, God worked through everyday people. They were inspired by him to record what Christians now accept as the Bible. The Old Testament is primarily a record of God's dealing with his chosen people. This would be the Hebrews or the Jews. The New Testament continues this record with the first century life of Jesus, and then it goes into the struggles that the early church faced. But for our series this winter, we're talking about the God's honest truth because we feel that we've been in a fog these last two years and we're sick of internet rumor and sick of conspiracy theory and sick of forwarded emails and the media. I want to call a time out. I want to pause. I want to take a breath. And I don't want, you know, this guy's truth or that guy's truth. In fact, there's no such thing as your truth or my truth. Truth is not abstract. Truth can be known. Truth can be proven. But what is it? What is truth? And while that question seems to be some deep philosophical puzzle that only brainy people can figure out, the answer to what is truth is not really that complex. Truth is what corresponds to reality. Consequently, what is real is true, and what is unreal is false. Now, the answer for the Christian is, well, the Bible is true. But the Bible makes some very distinctive truth claims, because it claims, for instance, that God exists. It also claims that God chose to communicate to his creation through prayer and through their inner morality and the Bible. In fact, Jesus claimed to be God in the flesh. And it was only if you believed in him that you would be saved. And then Jesus died, he was resurrected, and that also adds to the story and Christian belief. So these claims that the Bible makes they are either true or not true. They either correspond to reality or they don't. Now, Christians believe that they do correspond to reality, meaning that we believe that the Bible is true and that God really exists, Jesus is not a myth, and the resurrection actually happened. But how do we know this? I mean, is it all faith? Or is there any way to back up these claims? I want to talk about this for the next few weeks, because it's a really big subject, but also just so that we're all on the same page and there is no doubt. Because doubt about this book is out there. And there are questions, but let's face it. If the Bible is God's instruction manual for living, it's, if it's our roadmap to heaven and it's the means by which we should know God, then it becomes extremely important to know if the Bible is reliable. And I'll tell you what the questions are. They are, who wrote the Bible? Wasn't it people? And if it was people, don't people make mistakes? Don't people, especially multiple authors, 
sometimes contradict themselves. Who got to decide what books were in the Bible? Who got to decide what books were let out of the Bible? Is the Catholic Bible different? And why are there so many translations? And since there are so many translations, hasn't information gotten lost along the way? So we should look at the Bible. What is it? What is the Bible? Well, like we said, it's a collection of books and letters written by over 40 authors, and it spans over 1,500 years. In fact, the word Bible comes from the Latin word biblia and the Greek word biblos, and both mean book. The word probably comes from the city of Byblos, which is in Lebanon. It was an Egyptian city uh, where they first started milling paper. The Bible is also written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Now, to understand ancient Hebrew, the Bible is also our primary source. Our most important archaeological find was the Dead Sea Scrolls back in 1947. But before that, Hebrew was very difficult to translate. For instance, we all know that Joseph had a special coat, but we have no idea what made it special. The word we translate sometimes as many colors appears nowhere else in the Bible. So for all we know, it was a coat with long sleeves, or it was a coat with embroidery, or it was a coat with uh, choice wool. We have no way of knowing. How would you like to decipher a language that has no vowels, no spaces between the words, and reads right to left? Hebrew is very hard to read. Now, Aramaic, this was the language of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persian empires, all of which conquered Israel at one time or another. And if you remember the stories of, say, Daniel in the lion's den, that's where the Israelites began speaking this language, and it's replaced Hebrew sometimes over the years. But before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the earliest known manuscripts or copies of the Bible that we had were not in Hebrew, they were in Greek. Which brings us to Greek. <laughs> Greek is the oldest of all the European languages. It dates back 1400 years before Jesus. Now the Bible is written in Koine Greek, which is very different from contemporary Greek. And this is also what uh, the Persian and Egyptian trade merchants spoke uh, when they would trade. The Bible is also broken down into two sections that we call testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And testament is just another word for covenant, or agreement. The Old Testament is 39 books, believed to be in the inspired Word of God and written over a period of a thousand years. We break the Old Testament down into five sections. The Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses. The History books, so there's 12 books there. Poetry and Wisdom books, five more books. And the Prophets, 17 books. The Hebrew Bible is called the Tanakh. It has the same books, but they break their book down into three. They have it as the Torah, which is the law, the Nevilim, which is the prophets, and the Ketuvim, which is the writings. One of the oldest copies of the Old Testament is something we call the Septuagint. This copy was written in the third century in Alexandria, Egypt. And the legend says that King Ptolemy II wanted copies of every book in his library, and including the Hebrew scriptures. So we had 72 Jewish scribes translate the text into Greek. The entire process supposedly took 72 days, and Septuagint is Latin for 70. Now, this is a good place to talk about people. How do they write words down? Because there's no copy machines back then, so it's probably easy for someone to make a mistake. I mean, what if there were 11 commandments and we forgot one? Well, to combat mistakes, the Hebrew scribes came up with rules for copying, and here's just a few. The biblical scroll had to be written on clean animal parchment or paper, right? In other words, it can't have any spots or dots because you could mistake those for punctuation. The pen also had to be a feather from a clean bird. And before writing the name of God, the scribe would wipe his pen clean and say, I am writing the name of God, holy is his name. And once they began writing the name of God, they couldn't stop for any reason. Now, every single page they wrote on had to contain a specific amount of columns that were equal in length throughout the entire book. And every column could not be less than 48 or more than 60 lines in length. Each column had to be exactly 30 letters wide. And a space of three lines had to appear between each book. The space the size of a thread was to appear between each letter. 
And if letters ever accidentally touch each other, the entire manuscript was burned because there was no whiteout back then. Or if there was a tear or a smudge in the document, it was also burned. And no word could be copied from memory. Every word had to be copied letter for letter. After 30 days of completion, writing out your text, another scribe would come along and they would check your work. This inspector had to count the number of times every letter of the alphabet occurred in each book and then compare it with the original. They also had to find the middle word on every page and make sure it was the same as the original. Oh, and by the way, the Old Testament has 304,805 letters, which makes up 79,976 words. In addition, any manuscript that became old or worn or torn was destroyed to preserve the integrity of the text. That's a very extreme process. This is why before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had very few Hebrew manuscripts. But all of that changed in 1947 when a young shepherd boy discovered a series of caves that contained clay pots and what would later be called the Dead Sea Scrolls, wherein archaeologists and Bible scholars found 972 texts of scripture. Before 1947, discovery of the oldest biblical manuscript we had dated from 900 AD after 1947 and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest biblical manuscript we had was from 125 BC. Now, you could say, well, why is that significant? Well, for the critic who would argue that the Bible has been changed or altered over time, as it has been rewritten from language to language or from translation to translation, the true answer is once the Dead Sea Scrolls were compared to the ones we had been using for biblical translation, we found them to be 95% identical. That means the documents copied 1,000 years apart only had a 5% discrepancy. And that variation was only in spelling and style and in no way changed the meaning of the text. That means over the thousands of years, the Bible has been spoken, carried, translated, written. It has always remained the same. And we have the copies to prove it. That is fact. That is provable truth. The Bible is the copy that you buy in the store, but it is also the copy that we have that dates back to 125 BC. This is why books of the Old Testament are called canon. Canon comes from the Greek word rule, or standard of measure. Now, during the time of Christ, we know they had copies of the Hebrew Scriptures. Our own Bible tells us that Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah. In fact, Jesus quotes from 24 different books of the Old Testament. So if the Bible didn't just drop out of the sky, right, who put it all together? This is where you might hear another lie about a group of crotchety old men who hated women and loved slaves and loved war and murder, and they picked and chose what books would be put in the Bible. So what is the truth? Who decided what books would end up in the Old Testament? Well, after Jesus in the year 70, the Hebrew temple was destroyed by Rome, and thus many of those sacred writings were lost. So in fear that the Bible would be forgotten by time, Several rabbis founded a school of Jewish uh, law in Joppa, and they began compiling books uh, to be preserved. And the list that those men came up with became the canon that we have today. However, if you asked them how they chose what books, they would argue that they didn't choose the canon, but rather what they did was affirm the books that were already widely used for spiritual truth. So what about the Catholics? What about the Apocrypha? I mean, don't some Bibles contain extra books? Yes. The word Apocrypha is Latin, and it means secret. There are 16 apocryphal books that take place between 400 BC and the time of Jesus. So when the Jews were already affirming the canon in the year 70, the Apocrypha already existed. And so it was the Jews who actually rejected those books as scripture. 
And of course, they're not included in most present Bibles either. In fact, it wasn't even until 1546 that the Roman Catholic Church included them in their Bibles. So it's only been within the last 500 years. So is the Apocrypha scripture? Well, it depends on who you ask. Catholics would say yes, Protestants and Jews would say no. So why do you think they weren't included? Well, first, they're never quoted in the Old Testament or the New. And we don't see Jesus quote them or the early church. Plus, one other crucial thing, none of the writers of the apocryphal books ever say in their writing that they are in fact writing the words of God. And so, as we can see, the Bible, to get your book in the Bible, is a very exclusive club. Not every book makes the cut. Every book has to be vetted against some pretty strict guidelines. So what are the guidelines? How does a book get in the Bible? Well, in order for it to be considered canon, it has to be authoritative, which means when you read it, you know I am reading God's word. Second, it has to be prophetic, which means the words have to be true. Third, it has to be authentic, which means can we date this back to the author? Do we know who wrote this down? And then lastly, it has to be dynamic. In other words, it has to change lives. And then, of course, we look at history. Was it received? Was it collected? Was it read by the church? In other words, was this book a book that people kept and copied and preserved throughout history? Was it a bestseller? Because what makes a bestseller a bestseller? Word of mouth, popularity. You telling your friends, you buy more copies, you loan copies. People talk about the book over coffee. And this is what happened with the books of the Bible as well. The books that people read and loved and copied and taught from ended up in the Bible. The books that didn't change lives or the books that people didn't trust didn't. It wasn't a conspiracy. There was no ulterior motive. The books we now have are the same books that people have read and loved since 100 AD. Now, what about the New Testament? Well, the New Testament contains 27 books. The New Testament is also broken down into sections. The first four books are the Gospels, or the lives of Jesus. Uh, The second part is the letters. These are all the uh, correspondence written to churches and to people. And the last part is Revelation, or prophecy. Of the four Gospels, Mark was the first one to be written, perhaps as early as 64 or 65. Now, why is that important? Well, because this has, again, to do with reliability and accuracy. If Jesus died somewhere around the year 30, and Mark is writing in 64 or 65, then Mark is writing within 30 years of Jesus' life. That means when other people read the book of Mark for the first time, many people who had seen these events were alive, right? Which means if there were er any errors or any mistakes in what Mark wrote, it would have been very easy for critics to discredit. They would have said, this is a work of fiction. These things never happened. And then that book wouldn't have gained any traction. People wouldn't have read it. It wouldn't have been copied, right? There there would have been people alive who could have spoken out against this book. And this goes back again to the truth of the Bible and the Bible being reliable. Currently, it's estimated that there are 25,000 manuscripts of the Bible around the world. In other words, If I took the Bible I now have and I flew to all those places where the manuscripts were stored, I could compare my Bible that I have in my hands against the originals. 25,000 manuscripts is a lot. There is another testimony here that we should note as to how these books were loved by people and how much they were copied, how much they were circulated. I mean, you're going to compare the Bible against other books 
that we use throughout history, other books that tell us about history, other books we teach in school. For instance, uh, Homer's Iliad. You probably had to read that in college. We only have 643 manuscripts of that. The oldest copy we have is four, it was written 400 years after Homer. We have seven copies of the works of Plato. Seven. The oldest copy was written 1,300 years after Plato. 1,300 years. But the earliest copies of the Bible, or, you know, the oldest, the fragments we have are from the Gospel of John. And they were written 50 years after John's death. 50. In fact, the complete New Testament, we have 5,000 copies. And the time gap is only 225 years. Which means if you use all the accepted literary and historical standards that we have for examining the reliability of ancient texts, the Bible stands alone. It has no equal. There's no other historical book or speech that was ever written down that comes close. That is a fact. It is provable. It's reality. It's true. So does the New Testament also have canon? How was the New Testament put together? Well, again, some of the same rules. I mean, authorship, that was crucial. Originally, the rule was it had to be written by an apostle or Paul, with the exception of Mark and Luke, since they had both uh, been approved by the apostles. Now, of course, that led to a lot of other books supposedly written by biblical characters. I'm sure uh, you've watched a History Channel special about uh, the secret gospel of James or the gospel of Thomas or the apocalypse of Paul. Those are a couple that are out there. In fact, there's something like 50 different gospels in circulation before the New Testament was canonized. But just like the Old Testament, the New Testament canon came about simply by drawing on the books that people were reading. So as you can imagine, books that were not heavily taught, heavily used, or heavily copied, guess what? They weren't as widely circulated, and so there weren't as many copies out there. And let's just say uh, the Romans came to your house and said, uh, we need you to turn over all your illegal copies of the Bible. Well, <laughs> if you've got an extra Gospel of James lying around, you're probably going to give them that one, and they're going to burn that one because you're not going to have them burn any books that you believed were true or helpful. No, you're going to hand them the other books. Later, in 367, Athens, Athanasius of Alexandria authored the 39th Festal Letter, or the Easter Letter, which was approved by the Quinisext Council, and in it, he listed the 27 books of the New Testament that we use today the year 367. Then in 382, the Pope asked his own scribe, a man named Jerome, to translate the four Gospels into Latin. Jerome worked on the project for two years, and then the Pope died. Jerome continued to do his work, and he later uh, translated the entire Bible. And it became known as the Latin Vulgate. This is where we get the word vulgar, or uh, it just means common, right? It just means the Bible was written for the common person. This written for the common person to read. And so the Bible, the, the Latin Vulgate, that source text is still a source text that we use for some Bible translations today. Later in 393, the Synod of Hippo made a list of 27 canonical books, and guess what? Same list that we use today. Suffice it to say that the New Testament, over time, as it's developed or evolved over the course of 300 years of Christian history, has always remained the same. So what does that mean? Well, it means it wasn't one group. It wasn't one person. It wasn't one council that decided in one year at one time what should go in the Bible. The truth is no one person made this choice. No one group made this choice. No one council. It didn't even happen in one year. And since it was a slowly 
forming process over 300 years, then you can also conclude that there wasn't an agenda. There wasn't a secret plan when it was put together. The particular writings that became those of the New Testament happened over time. Now, canonization also raises other questions like, well, how do we know that these people weighed all the facts? Maybe they threw away a document that was written by an apostle and we never knew about it. All right, let me tell you a Bible story. When Josiah was king of Judah, the people of God at that time were worshiping a lot of false gods, and they were doing a lot of strange things. But Josiah began to miss the ways of his forefathers, and he set out to seek the God of his ancestor David, as 2 Chronicles 34 points out. So Josiah ordered the destruction of all the pagan idols and temples, and he started a rebuilding project. Well, one day, his own priest, Hilkiah, was working to rebuild the temple, and he came across an ancient scroll. And he felt the scroll was so important that he rushed the scroll to the king. The scribe began to read the scroll to King Josiah, and even though neither the scribe nor the king had ever read this scroll in their entire life, they were both able to recognize the language as being the word of God. How? Well, because it was the words that they resonated with, and it was the words that they had always heard as children. Second Chronicles 34 says, And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that have been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. You see, when Josiah and Hilkiah recognize the scriptures upon hearing them as God's word, he is now saying, I'm going to make sure that this book is read and known and recognized. See, people don't need to worry that God's word is going to get lost or that God's word is going to get misinterpreted. God knows, right? God knows that we have this book. And he knows this book has to be true for us, for our own salvation. So God is not going to allow his word to be lost. God is not going to allow his word to be twisted. So when people say, well, what if the wrong books were left in? Or what if the right books were left out? That statement shows a complete lack of trust in God. The answer simply is, God would not allow it. We know the Bible is right and perfect in the condition that we have it, because that is what we have. Psalm 19 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The author here, David, loves the word of God. And several of his writings talk about how much and care and devotion he has for it. And notice he uses words like perfect and reviving and sure and wise and right and pure and enlightening and enduring and righteous. He certainly thinks these are the words of God, right? And you wouldn't use those same words to describe something that was written by a person. You wouldn't talk about a cookbook that way or stereo instructions. In Psalm 119, he writes, all your commands can be trusted. David says, everything in the Bible can be trusted because it comes from God. Listen, and I'll say it again. God chose to reveal himself to us through a book. And this is the book we have. So if the book isn't right, then people didn't get it wrong. God did. Right? So by default, the book has to be right. Because by default, it's the book we have. Doesn't that make sense? Now, I've answered some questions this week, and we'll answer some more questions next week. But for now, let me just try to reassure uh, some doubts. Because, you know, this is interesting. We spend hours learning about God, and yet we devote very little time to learning about the book that we learn about God from. 
So let me ask you a question. Uh, when you read a newspaper or a magazine, have you ever scanned the page to look for something in particular? Have you ever held a pair of binoculars and you scan the horizon? Well, when we read and study the Bible, I'd like you to remember that word, scan, S-C-A-N. That uh, is how I think we can handle our critics and anyone who would spread lies about the Bible. And it's a helpful phrase. S-C-A-N, the S in scan means the Bible is sufficient. It's sufficient. That means the Bible contains everything we need for salvation and knowledge about God. It means scripture is clear and it makes us able to carry out and do any of our responsibilities, any obedience that we need to do, and it's enough. We don't need more and we're not missing out on anything. Second Timothy says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Notice, it says, so that you may be complete. Nobody has to be extra complete. They don't have to be more complete. No, complete is complete, which means scripture is sufficient. Let me teach you another Latin phrase, sola scriptura. It's one of the five pillars of the Reformation, and it means by Scripture alone. It was the battle cry that nobody would ever add to the Bible. Someone wants to add more to the Bible, they try to convince you that there's more to the story, right? If someone ever does that to you, just do like Nancy Reagan and just say no, right? Just say no. Don't be fooled by the lie when someone knocks on your door and says, oh, well, you've, you've only read the Bible? You need to know the rest of the story. There is no rest of the story. Martin Luther said it best, a simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. And sadly, this is the truth of scripture that we forget the most, you know? We can say all the right things we can about the Bible and we can even read it every day. But when life gets difficult or life gets a little bit boring, or we get a little too casual, we drift away. And we start looking for something new. We start looking for something different. We want a new revelation. We want a new experience. And we hope that brings us closer to God. But that is the way it is with fiction. Okay? That's the truth behind a lie. Lies always sound exciting and new. Fiction is exciting. Fiction's new. And you can say, well, I want to learn more about angels. I want to learn more about demons. I want to learn more about heaven. I want to learn more about hell. So I'm going to read this other book. And then we go to a bookstore and we read a book about a child who claimed to have died and went to heaven. Or we turn to a news anchor because now they're a best-selling author. It's amazing how many millions of copies of other books of fiction will sell and that we will read hoping to find something new and exciting because now for some reason we found the Bible boring. We read self-help books, we seek out mediums with spiritualists, we read our horoscope and fortune cookies and tarot cards, we try Kabbalah and hypnosis and a whole other slew of worldly elixirs. Are those things bad? Are those books bad? Well, here's the thing. This is what you need to ask. Do those books hurt or do they help? What happens when you consume a lot of media? You know, you end up forgetting where you heard it. You say, oh yeah, oh, oh, yeah. You know, I read that. I don't remember where I read it from. You heard that? Where did you hear that from? I don't remember. You understand? In other words, you don't want to try to think about the Bible and then can be confused about whether you read that in the Bible or not. For instance, verses like God helps those who help themselves, or verses like cleanliness is next to godliness. Those aren't Bible verses, right? When you read another source, sometimes your brain puts that information in the same folder or the same filing cabinet as the Bible. Look, the people who have already studied the Bible, people who are experts in these areas and who are immensely smarter than you or me, they've already removed all the beautiful diamonds out of the rock. They have separated the good and the bad and they've handed it to you in a book. 
Paul tells Timothy that the Bible is everything you need to be complete. You have all the articles of truths in your hand. So tell me, why would you want to go back to a rock pile and sift through gravel to find truth? The Bible is sufficient. Scan, S-C-A-N. C is for clarity. That means the Bible is clear. And you say, yeah, right. <laughs> Some of you are saying, you know, when I read the Bible, it's not clear. It's very confusing. Now, I agree. Parts of the Bible can be confusing. There's a lot of words and phrases in the Bible that are hard to decipher. And there are many passages in Scripture that can be interpreted more than one way. So what do we mean when we say the Bible is clear? Well, clear doesn't mean that every single verse in the Bible is obvious. Rather, it means if you're an ordinary person and you're using ordinary means to read, you can, on your own, accurately understand what's important to be faithful by yourself. In other words, the main things you need to know and believe, you can do. You can clearly read those things in the Bible. Most of it, you can clearly understand on your own. Listen to what Moses says. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, well, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us and make it clear so that we can hear and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you would say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. You see, because that's another lie that's out there. The Bible is full of contradictions. How can the Bible say something in one part and then something totally different in another part? That doesn't seem to be very clear. And yes, like we said, portions of the Bible are not as clear as others. Not every text has an obvious answer or an obvious meaning. But the good news is the Bible is a single story. It's told through a single voice, God's. So anytime something isn't clear in one section, you can simply go and look and reference it in another. When we approach a subject in the Bible, we're going to ask, well, what is the main theme? What is the big idea? What do you think God's intentions are with this? And we study other passages and we compare, and hopefully we arrive at a conclusion. Now, does that mean we all arrive at the same conclusion? No. But that doesn't mean the Bible is full of contradiction. If anything, it means people are full of contradiction, right? When in doubt, blame the reader, not the book. Remember, the Word of God hasn't changed. People change. The Bible is sufficient. S-C-A-N. The Bible is also the authority. Authority means God gets the last word. We must never allow the teachings of people or science or even the church to supersede Scripture. Remember, Scripture alone, right? Sola Scriptura. Second Peter 1, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter says, nothing in this book came from a human author. And so if it's all God's word, then it has to be the authority. Why do I accept the Bible as true? Why do I say the Bible is fact? because it's the highest authority. Not to mention that Jesus trusted the Bible. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, I trust what Jesus said, but I'm not so sure about the rest of the Bible. Yeah, but Jesus trusted the Bible. Matthew, Jesus says, for truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it's all accomplished. Jesus looks at the Bible and he says, all of this is gonna remain until the end of time. All of this, this book, is going to accomplish all the things that God wants to accomplish. In John 10, 35, Jesus said, Scripture cannot be broken. So Jesus proclaimed the authority of the Bible. Jesus said the Bible was true. In fact, in conversations, if Jesus ever got into an argument or a disagreement, Jesus would back up his claim with Scripture. So if Jesus believes the Bible is true, right? We have to. And lastly, listen. Me, as a pastor, I have no authority in myself. And I don't want people to ever take my word for it. God's church should be testing against 
every teacher and pastor always compare what they're saying against the authority. It's always a good idea. Bring your Bible to church. S-C-A-N. It's necessary. The Bible is necessary. In other words, we can't have this relationship with God without it. We can't just go off on a hunch or believe something because we feel it's true or something we'd like to be true. We need God's word to tell us how to live. We need God's word to tell us who Christ is. We need God's word to tell us how to be saved. John 6, many of Jesus' disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? And Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter said, I can't leave. (laughs) Where would I go? Your words are necessary. My relationship with you is necessary. The word of the world, the law of the world, the truth of the world is not enough. It's not enough. You need the word of God. First Corinthians says, among the mature, we do not impart wisdom. Rather, it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. See, people are always going to seek out new because it sounds relevant and hip. But new doesn't mean true. In fact, true things have been around forever. True things have always been true. Earthly wisdom is new and now, but biblical wisdom is ancient and everlasting. If we want the wisdom of passing fashion and impressive CEOs and talented celebrities, well, then you can look at the world. But if you want and need a necessary wisdom that is true and beyond us and that will never fail us, we have to look to the things that God has revealed to us in his word. S-C-A-N. Sufficient, clear, authoritative, necessary. Now, what's the difference that these four truths of Scripture make for us as we live our lives every day? Well, it means if you're a Christian counselor, you can offer wisdom meaningfully because Scripture is sufficient. It means Bible study leaders can teach with confidence because Scripture is clear. Pastors can preach with boldness because the biblical text is authoritative and evangelists can win souls for the kingdom because scripture is necessary. Folks, a majority of Bible uh, uh, people who claim to understand they know the Bible, they're going to tell you, oh, it's filled with errors, it's filled with contradictions. But in truth, those people, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know as much as they say they do. They've never really studied it. The fact of the matter is, the vast majority of people who have studied the Bible in depth, truly, are constantly amazed at both its authoritative uh, words and its accuracy. So why do people attack it? Why do people spread those lies? Why do they discredit it? Well, the answer is simple. Because the Bible asks something of you. See, most books are enjoyable to read, and at the end, they make no demands of you. They don't ask you to change your life. The Bible, on the other hand, makes some very big claims. It makes claims about who God is. It makes claims about how someone finds God. It it makes claims about how you should live your life. It, It tells you how to spend your money. It tells you how to raise your kids. It tells you how to run your business. It tells you how to be a spouse. It tells you how to make decisions. And most importantly, it tells you what you should believe. And if you don't notice, most of the time, uh, People don't like being told what to believe or what to do. Therefore, it is in the interest of many people and many groups to find reasons to disbelieve the Bible. They like to poke holes in it. Because if people can get away with thinking that it's not accurate or that its claims are invalid, then I don't have to change. I don't have to change my behavior and I don't have to give up my old life. But if the Bible is true, as hopefully I've shown you today, and it is authoritative, then the question is, 
Will you believe? Will you believe its claims on your life and will you dig into reading it every day and will you seek its guidance and seek its direction as you seek God? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your holy word. Thank you for its truth, its accuracy, its clarity. Thank you that we still have words that are true today as they were when they were written. Thank you that it is a revelation that teaches us who Jesus is and how I should live my life. And may my book of the Bible never collect dust. May its pages always be open. May I ever be reading it and searching through it. May I be hungry to read it and ingest it. May I never forget these words. May they be a part of my life forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Hey, I want to remind you that we're here. We're open every single Sunday. We want you to come by. We want you to be in this church. We want to fill this church. We want to show the outside world that we're sick of their lies and that we are going to return to truth. We're going to turn to fellowship. We're going to return to biblical understanding. We're going to be the body of Christ every single week. We have two services, one at 930, a traditional service with a choir, and then we have one at 11 o'clock, which is more contemporary. And we have a worship team. We also have a children's program at that hour. We have youth group at that hour. We also have youth group every single Wednesday at six o'clock. Just send your kid over on their bike or their skateboard. We will even feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.